J.A. Wiley, Jesuitism. We are now reading chapter 20, and this is the part two of this uh, reading from this original book. Our Father in heaven, blessed all of us today as we learn and study the snares of the enemy. I pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Page 118, the second paragraph. There are faults, too, on the side of the Irish farmers. Some are skillful and industrious, and it may be drawn down eviction upon their heads by the very thing which ought to shield them from it. Even the augmented value of their farms, but they are the exception. The greater part of Irish cul cultivators are unskillful, slovenly, idle. Under them, it is deterioration that is taking place. And the landlord has simply to choose between the eviction of the tenant and his own inevitable ruin. Further, it was a tremendous error on the part of the Irish nation to permit itself to become dependent for the staple of its subsistence on one single root, the potato. This was a short-sightedness which none but savages, one would think, could have fallen into. The awful consequences were seen when the potato disease broke out in 1846. When that calamity visited Ireland, there were believed to be nearly 9 millions of inhabitants in it. Of these, there were 2 millions who did not possess so much as a potato field, and who even in, an, in ordinary years had to be supported by charity. In 1846, the food of the three-fourths of the population was suddenly swept away. And for you, tragedies, even in the tragic history of Ireland, are so appalling as that which followed. Of the Irish people, some millions had to flee to America, and some millions more, without food and without the means of immigrating, succumbed to the famine and sunk into the grave. One other thing, a normal source of calamity and suffering to Ireland, do we here specify? There is a physical law, according to which greatly impoverished races multiply their numbers at a prodig prodigious ratio, as if nature were making an effort to ward off the extinction that threatens them. This law has been found to be operative in Ireland, endowing the Irish race with a prolific nest that constantly pours a stream of population upon their soil, which is beyond its power of sustaining. The consequence is that when the potato or the other harvest fails, the famines of that land are attended by mortality that is truly dreadful. We are next reminded of the penal laws for a short while enforced against Ireland. This is a subject which has two sides. A rapid cursory glance at the history of the country since its connection with the British crown can alone set the matter in its true light and furnish the reader with the facts necessary to enable them him to judge candidly of this matter. Down to the middle of the 12th century, Ireland maintained both its ecclesiastical and its political independence. Its people were governed by the descendants of their ancient kings, and its church neither professed the creed nor submitted to the jurisdiction of Rome. Who robbed it of this independence? The Catholic Irish. Do not care to hear of, the, hear of this affair. But history makes no secret of it. The man who enslaved Ireland was the Pope. He usurped the rights of its church and he brought in the arms of a foreign power to crush its evil independence. Breakspeare, Adrian IV, the one English name in the role of the world's worst tyrants, in virtue of being God's vicegerent and Lord Paramount, of all the kingdoms of Christendom, claimed Ireland as his own, or in papal phrenology, part of the patrimony of Peter, by a bull dated AD 1155. He next sold it to Henry II of England on condition that he should pay a penny a year for each house in the kingdom. The English king so far had been no very exemplary son of the church, but now he crouched down before the pontiff and consented to hold Ireland as a fifth of the papal see. But the infamous bargain betwixt, betwixt the king and the pontiff could not be consummated, but with the connivance of the Irish bishops several of whom the Pope had recently sent Pauls. These men, seeing in the affair the prospect of a vast succession of riches and dignities to themselves, entered into secret negotiations with Henry. 
And before their countrymen were aware that the Pope had sold them to the English monarch and that the bishops were preparing to betray the liberties of the country. The latter had opened the gates of Ireland to the soldiers of England. At a meeting of the Catholic Association in Dublin, O'Connell speaking of the landing of Henry II to take possession of his new territories gives us both a history and a picture for once we can join issue with the agitator. It was on the evening of the 23rd of August, October 1172, 1171, that the first hostile English footstep pressed the soil of Ireland. It is said to have been a sweet and mild evening when the invading party entered the noble estuary formed by the conflux of the sewer, the Nore, and the borough of the city of Waterford. A, a curse be that day in the memory of all future generations of Irishmen. When the invaders first touched our shores, they came to a nation famous for its love of learning, its piety and its heroism. They came when internal dissension separated her sons and wasted their energies. Internal traitors led on the invaders. Her sons fell in no fight. Her liberties were crushed in no battle. But domestic treason and foreign invaders doomed Ireland to seven centuries of oppression. The independence of Ireland, says Dr. William Fellan, was not crushed in battle, but quietly sold in the silence of the prelates, those internal traitors to whom the orator alluded, but whom he, had, he was much too prudent to name. This transaction brought about us, we have seen, by the mutual ambition and treachery of three parties, the Pope, the English King, and the Irish bishops, was the fountainhead of, of the miseries, which have ever since flowed in the continuous stream upon Ireland. Up till this time, each sept had determined the form of its worship, appointed its clergy, and arranged all its ecclesiastical matters without control by any outside authority, authority outside of its own territory. Ireland, it is true, was no longer the highly civilized and Christian country it had been in the 7th and 8th centuries. It had been first desolated and next barbarized by the frequent incursions of the northern corsairs in the 9th and 10th centuries. Nevertheless, it still enjoyed a measure of rude freedom, broken only by the feuds of its rival pity chieftains. But now new elements of discord were introduced, the expectations of no one of the three parties who had been concerned in the great original wrong than the country were fully realized. The English king was not able fully to conquer and occupy Ireland. The Pope's tribute was not regularly paid, and although lands, abbesses, and cathedral seats, in short, paid, and although lands, in short, wealth in every form was lavishly poured in the clergy, their boundless desires were not satiated. In Ireland became the battleground of three powerful and hostile parties who fiercely warred against one another, but were united in their hostility to the Irish people, who were trodden down into dire slavery and unspeakable misery. The remains of the early Christian Church of Ireland were crushed out. Its adherents were driven into the remote wilds of the country and finally disappeared in the universal submission of the nation to the yoke of Rome. There followed the night of ignorance, so dark that even the memory of the Irish primitive church was lost, and Ireland came to believe that she had always been in communion with the Romish sea. Of the three parties into which Ireland was divided, whose rivals' hatreds, hatreds kept it in a state of perpetual distraction, the bishops were by much more the more powerful. The English had little influence beyond the pale, a somewhat circumscribed region lying around Dublin. The native nobles were weakened and divided. The hierarchy stood up strong in their numbers, in their superior mental astuteness, and their now swollen wealth. And the king was unable to check a priestly dominancy, or whose licentiousness filled the land with ignorance, turbulence, and crime. The native population between the two millstones of their nobles and their priests implored the king to extend to them the benefit and protection of the English laws. The king was well disposed to grant the, bo the boon supplicated for, but his intentions and wishes were frustrated, mainly by the bishops who found their interest to lie in keeping the Irish in hopeless dependence and villainage, such as the brief but truthful history of Ireland for four centuries. The great source of Irish misery has been, says Dr. Pillan, not the power of England, but its want of power. We come now to the Reformation. 
England threw off the yoke of Rome from her own neck, and we would have expected to see her use wise endeavors to break that yoke from off the neck of the sister kingdom, seeing they were her own soldiers who had so largely assisted to rivet. England, now reformed and Protestant, had, had a grand opportunity presented to her of atoning for her great crime and taking part with the Pope in plunging Ireland into darkness. Overjoyed, she might have been to recompense its poor people for the ages of suffering that had passed over them since that sweet and mild evening in 1171, when her soldiers first landed on the shore by kindling among the lamp of the gospel, England herself being judged in that she had renounced the popish faith as idolatrous and damnable, would in so acting have been bestowing on Ireland both a temporal and an eternal salvation. What a different future would have been in store for both herself and the sister country. What a prosperity and splendor would have been the, the lot of both Ireland's had England seized the golden opportunity. She would have cured the vice inherent in the first connection of the two countries and wiping from the memory of both nations the crimes and the miseries that have flowed from it. She would have established a new and eternal union between herself and Ireland at the altar of common faith. Steps in that direction, England did in, indeed take, but viewed in the light of the occasion and of the solemn responsibility she had incurred to the Irish people. They were glaringly inadequate. She, neither with few exceptions, sent the right men nor took the right methods, nor went about the matter in the right spirit, nor adopted the right scale. To plant the Reformation in Ireland was worth the forethought, the money, the labor into which, with which kingdoms are established. In truth, there was no conquest in all the earth, not even of that of the largest and richest continent on the globe, which would have so re recompensed England as she would have been recompensed by the diffusion of the fate of the Bible among the Irish people. But alas... The littlenesses, the intrigues, the selfishness, the worldliness, which had poisoned the whole intercourse of the two countries since their connection began this created an effort, which, if it was succeeded, must, must stand forth not only unpolluted but by these stains, but pure and holy beyond the measure of all other causes. The unhappy consequence has been that Ireland is as popish at this day as it ever was, and that it is more under the dominancy of the hierarchy than during the calamitous era which we have repeatedly traced. This is a great sin of which England has been guilty. Although the agitator is silent, rejecting it, and we never find it catalogued in the list of wrongs, injustices, and oppressions, which Great Britain is alleged to have inflicted on the sister island. Lesser iniquities are held up to scathing reprobation, but no orator enables, enables her eloquence or sanctifies and sublimes the passions which he seeks to arouse, to arouse by holding up to righteous condemnation, this parent iniquity, this deep, this everlasting wrong. We'll continue reading the next paragraph the next time. And God our Father, God bless you in his only begotten divine Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious to you now and forevermore.